going, turning tonight to uh, Luke chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. I do want to say this. There's a lot going on around here, a lot of people working and doing stuff around here. Before you question your ability, make sure you examine your effort. A lot of people don't lack ability, they lack effort. You hear what I'm saying? And what I'm going to get into tonight, you need to understand, there's a lot of elasticity in today's Christianity. We can't have categories of sin or levels of sin. Big sins, little sins, white lies, big lies, almost sins, used to be sins. But really you're going to find that God only has two categories. Sheep and goats. Heaven or hell. Wheat or chaff. Don't justify sin. Get it repented of. Get it taken care of. Amen? Luke chapter 3. I keep wanting to say John 3.16. It's Luke. Chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh. The latchet of his shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We like that. We like getting baptized in Jesus' name. Getting full of the Holy Ghost and getting on fire for God. Can I get an amen? amen. But he didn't do all that so you get goosebumps to shout and a reason to run in a building. Verse 17 says, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor, his threshing floor, his house. Are you hearing me tonight? And will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Lord, we thank you so much for your word tonight. Pray, God, that grace and mercy, Lord, will, will flow as we glean from your word to understand that you're not just a God of grace, but you're also a God of judgment. And your word is forever settled. We cannot change it, alter it, or twist its meaning in any way. Help us tonight as we go into your word. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Um, you can be seated. It's, it's, it's I thought about this, and I really don't prepare opening remarks. And I, I really shoot from the hip. I got some verses written down, a few things I want to say, but I... I, I shoot from the hip, but when you take verse 17 and you lay it over the translators, the word fan is lit literally means a winnowing fork. Now, you and I aren't farmers. We're not out there winnowing the wheat. We go to Costco or Fry's or... Walmart and buy our wheat bagged up already turned into bread. In fact, very few people are even buying flour anymore today. Maybe a couple of the elder saints that still know how to bake. <laughs> or, you know, whatever it is that you do. Whose fan or winnowing fork is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge. That means to cleanse perfectly. His floor. And will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. That word unquenchable is interesting because when it's translated, it's the, where we get the word asbestos from. <laughs> Pretty interesting. It's not extinguished or unex unquenchable is what it means. So it's it's pretty interesting. The word platoon is the word fan, which is the winnowing fork. In the Bible, 
it's uh, used to uh, lift up the wheat into the air to allow the wind to separate the lighter chaff to blow away and the grain, the edible part to fall to the floor. The threshing or is the pounding of it, the beating of it. He puts the wheat through a process. You have to understand that that life is putting you through a process. And I'm going to talk about this. sin is a process. Life is a process. You didn't go sin. It was birthed in your mind and your heart first. No one backslides overnight. There was something going on in your heart and something going on in your mind. And so understanding the threshing and the winnowing to understand what God's talking about with his parabolic sayings. Let's turn to Matthew 13 and 30 because th this is the, uh, the plight of the pastor today, the plight of the church. Um, we want to deal with things. We want to help people grow instead of go. They do, they do plenty of going on their own. It says in, in Matthew 13 and 30 in your Bible, let bro, both grow together until the harvest. To the end. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together first to tares. There's going to be a separating going on. We're going to know who the lords are and who aren't. You'll bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. John foretold and said, Jesus is a baptizer, but he's also the thresher. He is the savior and the separator. A lot of people want a savior. They don't want a Lord. He is both the God of mercy and a God of judgment. This meek and lowly Jesus that gets preached about. Everybody's a Christian. Whose church is right? What's right? Does the Bible have a say in my life? That's your interpretation. These are comments of people that don't have a walk with God. These are people that aren't really reading the word of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The meek and lowly Jesus that's proclaimed by secular Christianity bears no similarity to the real Jesus of the Bible. The image or concept that humanity can superimpose its will on God is a fallacy. That we say what's right and wrong and what's good and evil, what's righteous and unrighteous is a lie. Luke 4 and 4, Jesus being tempted makes a statement to the arch enemy of the world. Satan answered him saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. We're going to eat, but to truly live. You need every word of God. I want you to realize that it was the Prince of Peace who said, Think not I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. The same one they depict that they can walk around and tell them, This is what I'm going to do for you, Jesus. I know you asked for this or they said that, but I don't like that church or those rules imposing on my life. Are you hearing me? Listen. It is God's word which divides the righteous from the unrighteous. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joint and the marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You won't twist God's word to fit you. 
you need to change to fit his word. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 say, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Listen, here's the mercy. That you present your bodies, your life, your physical being, a living sacrifice. And it begins with the word, word holy. That means separated unto. It says it. Acceptable unto God. Well, while you're trying to fit in the world, you're not going to be acceptable unto God. Are you hearing what he's saying? Which is your reasonable service. Because he goes on, and be not conformed. That means there's going to be a difference. Listen to me, folks. Between how you live for God and how you don't. The world don't. So if you're looking like them and dressing like them and speaking like them and acting like them and watching what they watch and reading what they read and speaking like them and listening to that, you're conforming to that and you're missing that you're to be transformed by the, the renewing. I preached the other day about the, about the prodigal son. Do you realize what he did in the pig pen? He changed his mind. He changed his mind. Wait, I got to get my mind right. What your mind thinks you're going to do. What you think about is what you're going to partake of. If you're going to sin, it got birth right here. You started negotiating in your mind. Sin is not an act. It's a process. Oh, I'll get into that. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be transformed. Be renewed. Like he said, like he told the lady caught in adultery, go and sin no more. He didn't say, I got you. Go ahead and keep on like he was doing. Romans, Paul speaking, tells us, let not sin therefore reign, rule in your mortal body. What I do in my body matters. How I dress, what I wear, speaks of what I serve. Mm. That ye should obey, you obey in the lust thereof. Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. That's a rough, that this is rough, this is rough preaching, teaching, because it's so easy to fit in. It's easy to want to fit in. It's not even easy, easy being the odd one out. We all know that society's like a bunch of chickens. You take a chicken with a spot on it, and you put it in with a bunch of chickens, they'll pick it to death. That lets you know the level of humanity. Look how hard you have to fit into this world. And you'll turn around and get mad at the church for showing you, you know what, you don't have to fit in with that. we got something better. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. I'm talking about spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity is say, oh, do I have to? That's a child. Do I really got to do? Maturity says, man, that's my job. That's my involvement. This, this is what's expected of me. Mm -hmm. You'll find the, it's the adults that are, are paying the bills and doing the work, and you turn around to child. Is that do I got to? And this, this, this lets you know where you're at with God. Man, they got a lot of rules at that church. Really? Go try living and getting along with them out there. They'll eat their own right now. Go look at the cover of National Enquirer. That person that was there was a darling at one point. I'm telling you that we henceforth, Ephesians, be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. That is a teaching. That is an ideology. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up. See, grow up's in the Bible. Turn to your neighbor and say, grow up. Grow up. 
unto him in all things, which is the head even Christ. Throughout Jesus' teaching and earthly ministry, he emphasized that. Are you ready? There's going to be two camps in his church. There's going to be two kinds of people in the body of Christ. Two kinds of people claiming to be his church and his kingdom. This is important to understand. However, only one group would really be his people. And statistically, it's usually the smaller of the two. Luke chapter 13, verse 23, it begins, it says, Then said one to him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto him, Strive, strive. Everybody say strive. To enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Lord, Lord, hear it. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know not, know you not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, ye, there's a group of people that are in the church. Have we not eaten and drunk in thy presence? And thou hast taught, I like this, in our streets. And thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you. I know you not when she are. De depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Iniquity is lawlessness. We felt your presence. We've been in your presence. Your word was taught in our neighborhood. It's interesting that they felt his presence. But the Bible talks about being filled with his spirit. There's a lot of people, man, I feel the presence of God. That's great, but have you been filled? Have you got the Holy Ghost? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? It's, it's wonderful to feel the presence of God on the outside, but in order to be led into all truth, you've got to get the Holy Ghost, as the scripture says, on the inside. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The word was taught. You taught in our streets. I think that's pretty profound because it literally means it was out in the street, but you never took it heart and you never took it home. It didn't become a part of your life. It was something down there at the church house, but it didn't affect your house. It didn't affect you. Man, man, I'm not trying to hurt nobody. I'm not trying to bother nobody, but I'll be honest with you. I'm glad someone laid this on the line for me because I needed saved from the mess I was in, not only to be saved physically, but to be saved spiritually. It saved my life physically. I was killing myself with worldly living. I was killing myself with drugs and, and, and the type of people I was hanging around and the type of things I was doing. It was literally only a matter of time. I ran into people later. I can't even believe you're alive, they would say to me. It's sad when the worldly people know you're living a life that's deadly. What's really sad is when church people aren't willing to tell a worldly person that used to be church, what are you doing to yourself? Because Jesus said, I never knew you. Coming to church and not changing, something's wrong. I can't hang around you without you affecting me. You know, when, when Sister Pearl come around, she talks about keto. I think of keto every day. Every time I look at food, every time I think, well, I wonder if Sister Pearl would be okay with us eating that. And, and when I look at cake, I think of my mother and Sister Davenport. You know? When I look at shoes, I think of Brother Lawrence because we've kidded around about that. If I see a muscle car or a muscle, any day, I'm thinking of Brother Dad. There's the effect uh, of being around. So let me tell you, you can't get in a true church without the becoming, you know what? I need to change some things about me. I want to adopt some of the things of the personality of Jesus Christ and his church. We got a lot of superficial questions. Don't just come walking in here and feel the external presence of the Lord. You need to get him on the inside. Now, I'm not talking about people that are, are, have followed the new birth of the Holy Ghost and are struggling with some issues because I want to say that, you know, I've been living for God for a while and I'm still working, but if you came in today and you repented and got baptized in Jesus' name full of the Holy Ghost, you're as saved as I am at that moment. But if I go out 
and I do something stupid that I know better, you're better off than I am, even though I've been around this thing for 30-something years. Are you here? What? Can you hear me? Can, can you hear me, church? So, this is referencing folks that refuse to let his word be truth. When you refuse to seek the infilling of the Holy Ghost, that's clearly seen in Scripture in the book of Acts and taught by his disciples and clearly seen in the word of God. You got Acts 2, 38, 41, and 42. You got Acts 10 and Acts 19. People were actually rebaptized in the word of God. I don't know what the argument is. There is no argument. There, there's no division. There's no discord. Let God be true and every man a liar. If I say something contrary to the word, I'm wrong. The word is right. They obeyed the disciples teaching and preaching and they were added unto the church daily. The Bible says that. So whilst I'm teaching all this, remember, Jesus has a fan in his hand thoroughly purging his floor. Jesus goes on and he gives us other examples how he plans to divide those who are the bride and those who are not, those that are the church and those that are not. Those that are around the church and those that are in the church. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Notice again the separation happens. This is scary, folks. At the end. They gathered the tares and the wheat at the end. Okay, are you hearing me? The two groups are around each other, intertwined with each other, amongst each other. In fact, not much really seems different on the surface. Matthew 25 tells us the story of the ten virgins. Everything was similar but one issue. And that one issue separated between wise and foolish. One. It wasn't ironic that the oil was the difference. We need to be full of the Holy Ghost anointing, folks. And all, all, they were all together till the end. Mm -hmm. The difference was so small, but big enough to be the point of separation. In Matthew 7 on the Sermon on the Mount, he tells of multiple ways here. He talks about two ways, the broad way and the narrow way talks about two trees, the good and the corrupt. So even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. You know, Brother Clark used to tell us, I mean, Brother Carlton Clark, about being a fruit inspector. You ever get around that person that you can't tell them anything to, to correct? He said, man, there should be fruit I should pick from there, but you're not producing it. You're not producing fruit. It's missing. So every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Fruit? This one's caustic and one's Christian. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. So we know he talks about two ways, two trees, and then two houses. The house is identical. But with close inspection, they're built on two different things. Listen, this is important to know. Jesus is not contrasting the church and the world here. He's talking about two kinds of believers which completely destroys an ideology of today that just believe in you're saved. It's very clear. Despite popular ideology, just believing isn't enough. Just believing is not complete. Your life and actions must mature. You must grow up. When you get married and you're young, you grow together. You grow up together. Mm -hmm. When you were born and you got put in diapers, there was a time there, we, oh, we, you're not going to do nothing. We're just going to pamper you for a while, take care of you for a while. But at a certain point, man, you ought to be old enough to take out the trash around here. 
You ought to be able to do the dishes now without being told. There ought to be something about you that's do I got to, oh, I'm, I'm mature now. What can I do? I want to be fruitful. I want to be a Christian. I want to be the real thing. Your speech and conduct must be transformed. I used to cuss. Bad. I thought it was what you were supposed to do. Everybody's all silent. There were things I watched before I won't watch today. There were people I've hung around that I won't hang around today. I may speak to them, but I'm not hanging around you. Your life and your actions must mature. If you don't learn from this, you'll repeat history. I'm thankful someone got a hold of me with this truth. Otherwise, I'd ended up in rehab. You ended up in rehab twice. Someone's being kind of dumb. I don't, I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. But if you don't learn from history, you repeat it. Hello? You ever hit your thumb with, thumb with a hammer? You move the thumb. You don't sit there, it's okay, it just happens in life. No, it don't. Jesus has come to give you life and that more abundantly. But you got an enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's good at destroying lives. People should know you're a Christian visibly, actively, and verbally. They should be able to look at us and go, they're different. You're different. Why? Since Jesus came into my life. I was at a Christian concert, a Carmen concert. You remember those back in the 80s? A long time ago. I'm just radically saved. Yeah, I went to that concert. And I walked in there, you know, I'm just a young guy. First Christian concert, a far cry from the other concerts I went to. And I go to sit down and I look up and there's a guy from high school. A look of fear over his face. It broke my heart. It was a wake-up call, Brother Lawrence. Just, just his face went white. And cool. He was just like five or six people down. And I, I'm going towards him. I used to pulverize him in high school. Yeah, I was a jerk. I walked over to him. It was just a few years after high school. Stuck out my hand, apologized, made it right. You know what he said to me? You are the last person I ever thought to do anything with Christianity. You are the last. You were a devil. I just can't believe you're here. No, he wasn't mean about it. He was, he was weeping. Wow. What happened? He still remembered the guy in high school. But he got to meet the guy after Jesus had been working on his life. I didn't grab him around the throat. I didn't body slam him. I didn't punch him. I didn't do nothing. I shook his hand. I hugged his neck. Why? I, I, I changed. I didn't come living for God. I expect God to save me doing the same things. I put down the drugs. I put down the guns in that manner. I stopped how I spoke. And I tried to make friends instead of enemies everywhere I went. I was one of those guys that looked for someone to look at me wrong. No, I did. And what happened? When my father was killed, I changed. I remember being in the garage a few days after, and three guys go walking by, and they look in, and I went out there ready to fight all three. When you're angry and you're worldly, you don't know how to express yourself. But I'm thankful that when I got baptized and repent, baptized and got full of the Holy Ghost, something really happened. I'm not, it was real. And I got around other Christian people, and I'm thankful for the man of God, oh no, don't trust me, I wasn't perfect. There was a long process that's still going on here 30 something years later about me changing. Because God is looking for fruit. God is looking for people that are being transformed by the renewing of their mind, by, by the implication of the word of God and reading it, having preaching and teaching and, and, and interaction with people of faith. People should know you're a Christian. James declares in, in Matthew, in, in James 2, I'm going to go to James, James 2.18, James 2.20, 2.20. I want you to listen to this. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. 
You know, this is Jesus' half-brother. He that wasn't a believer until after Jesus resurrected. He, <laughs> they were not, that's my brother. Resurrect. Oh. He wasn't playing. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? You got to get real with this thing. You got to get it on the inside. Verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I'm fixing to change some of my ways. You got to strive to live godly in this world. Strive to enter in. Luke says in 13, 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter, but shall not be able. What is it? Taking up my cross and denying myself. Oh, let me be a Christian. Let me put down the foolish things of this world and take up my cross and follow him. Let me curb, let me curb how I speak. Let me curb how I act. Let me... In Acts 2.40, it says, and with many words that he testified, sort of saying, save yourselves. You have a hand in this thing. He paid the price to open the door, but you got to walk through this from this untoward generation. you got to save yourself from this untoward generation. You can't be like them and be saved. Remember, there's two camps in one church. Then they that gladly received his word. I can't believe the amount of people I work with on a daily, weekly, yearly basis that in a, in a, in a flash they turn around and criticize and complain. I, I'm like, Man, I wish they lived up to their own standards. They that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day were added unto them 3,000 souls and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking bread and in prayer, there's got to be, your life needs to change when you come in contact with Jesus. And I know I need to hurry, but if I ran in here tonight and said, you know, I got hit by a truck on the way to church, none is going to believe me. <laughs> if I came into the church tonight and I said I got hit by a truck, really? But if I came walking in here with crutches and bad, man, I get hit by a truck. Y'all gonna believe me. Sadly, people meet us and when we say we're a Christian, they look at us. I can't tell. I can't tell. Let's look at this text again. Matthew 7, 21 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Isn't this about going to heaven, folks? But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, the last, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. And in thy name the many wonderful works. Wonderful to who? Is what you're doing wonderful to you or wonderful to God? Mm. What is your work? What are you working on? What are you doing? Then will I profess them, I never knew you. Listen to what he says. Depart from me, that work. It's not that you're not doing anything. You're doing the wrong things. Heaven's on the line here. Jesus said at the age of 12, I must be about my father's business. What are you involved in? Many will say, Even, look what I was doing, Jesus. Look what I believed. I believed in you, Jesus. I did so much in your name. But he says, I never knew you. Wait a minute, folks. I think we need to listen here. I think we need to stop and take a moment apart I love worship, and I love shouting and running. The message I preach Sunday, I love that kind of preaching and teaching. 
But what good is jumping and shouting at the majesty of God if we lose out because we're really not? Are you the real deal? Or just another mess? It's not that you're not around the church, you are. It's not that you're not a believer, you are. It's like the Bible says, he says, all have not obeyed the gospel. You got your own. You, we create our own doctrines. We create our own. That's why there's, there's contention and division in the church. That's why there's church splits and problems and people going to this church and that church. There's something wrong in humanity. Even if you got mad at someone in church, you're to love your enemies. Oh, but I don't like that part. Forgive them. Oh, but I don't like that part. Love them. Oh, but I don't like that part. Oh, where's your Christianity? Because you ain't like Jesus. Like you told Cain, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Listen. In order to understand, we need to understand the response of the claimed relationship in this verse. Because the Greek shows astonishment of the speaker. And then will I profess... He's not going to tell you now. You need to be led of the Holy Ghost. But you can stifle that. That's not for me. I'm mad. I'm I'm not going to forgive that. I'm not going to let that go. Or like me. I'm turning the other cheek, but I'm bringing a fist with it. Oh, yeah. I've said it. Until I get my pound of flesh. See, the problem is that we want to take things in our own hands. And the moment we take it in our hands, we're not in his hands. It sounds good to say if someone touched my grandbabies or my babies, I'd be all big and bad in humanity. I don't think I've said anything more stupid. What am I going to do? Oh, God, that I would get myself in his hands and they would follow suit then no matter what happens. But listen to this. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, you that work iniquity. In other words, I've carried you around long enough. I've had you around long enough, talking this, talking all that, and I, I, all this stuff, you've been walking in and out of my church, hanging around real church people, and I've just had it with you. Be gone! You contrast that with this scripture in, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 3. Wherefore I give a gift to you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God called Jesus a curse. And that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. The division, the separation which takes place at the judgment will be absolutely shocking. Wait a minute. Look at my resume, Jesus. You can't tell me I can't come in here. I built this place. Everybody saw my giving and my worship. and I. But because of the hidden, and careless iniquity, the church ain't going to tell me he ain't. He's pastor, but he ain't going to be my pastor. I ain't going to do nothing for that church. And at the end, when it's too late, it'll be exposed what you love, what you are really, you'll be open. For all to see everything, the thoughts, the intents of the heart. You're not going to stay. You're not going to stand there and argue with Jesus. You're not going to. St- Do we? We may argue with one another. Will we think we're going to argue with God? I have Steve's law. Sadly, I have two wonderful people that are subjected to Steve's law. (laughs) 
Anybody got law at your house? There's Sister Pearl law. You gonna eat what I'm gonna tell you? You gonna eat me? God, I watch her ordering food. Don't confuse that. It's love. I don't want you 400 pounds. Pal, you're going to eat this broccoli. Or no, cauliflower. You put that pot. You ain't ordering that pot. Now, give me the menu. And, and there's Verdell Law. <laughs> Can I get? I'm looking out for you, you clown. You can't be eating that. But then there's Lawrence. Oh, give me them jelly beans right now. You can. I know you like them, but they're not good for you. I know you want to, it's not good for you. They get mad at me. I, I, I get on there. What you do? Man, you better lock them doors when you walk in this house. That's how I am. Well, you're home. I don't want to deal with somebody. Let them check out the door and go, I can't get in. Will I deal with them if they get in? Yes, but let's not invite them. I really don't want the altercation. Let's use some sense and avoid problems. Jesus gave us his word. Let's avoid some of that. I don't want to hear, depart from me. I never knew you. Let me get close to Jesus. Let me get his word in my heart that I might not sin against him. Listen on Matthew, in Matthew 13. On the same day that the Pharisees accused him of having a devil, Jesus tells several parables which define the nature of his kingdom. More than half of them deal with the presence of evildoers who try to hide themselves in the kingdom. There's going to be people that aren't of the kingdom hidden in the kingdom. And sometimes you're married to them. Sometimes you birthed them. <laughs> the Bible talks about Enemies will be those of your own household. And it will cause a variance in a home between the believers and the non-believers. Between those bearing fruit and not bearing fruit. There comes a conflict. Mm -hmm. So Jesus tells several parables which define the nature of the kingdom of God. And more than half of them deal with this, the presence of evildoers. Come on, we, we, we have some stuff like that in the church. So in discord. God hates discord. He hates division. You can't be right with God going to church disobeying his word. You may say you're a believer and you may go to church, but you ain't saved. You're lying to yourself. You can't disobey scripture and go to church and say, I'm saved because I still go to church. No, believers aren't saved. Doers are. The parable of the wheat and the tares shows us that sadly there are false Christians in the kingdom. He says, I never knew you. The most common kind of wheat or tare in the Holy Land is called a bearded darnel. It's actually a poisonous grass. It's almost indistinguishable from the wheat until it grows to maturity. Then you can tell. And it is uprooted just before the harvest to be bundled and burned. The damage happened. Remember what he said? How then hath it tears? An evil one came in. The Bible sets up, I'm not getting all this, the structure of a church. An order of a church. God is all about order. It doesn't change. In the family, there's order. The world doesn't want it. In fact, uh, we got a, 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 and I'm not getting into whether you agree or not, but they have a, a lady going right now to become a uh, Supreme Court justice. And the left is all upset because she has the con biblical concept of being submitted to her husband. Hey, if you don't like being submitted to your husband, you're not in the word of God. You, you may come to church, but you're not in his church. Because you have to understand it's him, your husband, and you. Not that you're less. It's an order. It's an order. It's how he set it up. I know it's, 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 they don't like it in the world. But you know what? I'm not living for the world. I don't want to conform to that. I want to conform to the word of God. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I, that's another Bible study. We'll get into that later sometime. But the damage happened in the field while men slept, and it was done by the enemy. Listen, church, and I'm going to help some of you. I'm not going to pull up the false to plant the truth. You've got to let both grow together. i got to let them both grow together. I can't turn around and say, hey, you're in. Because the final division belongs to Jesus. But it is our task to issue the warning of God's word. It's clear that God is already beginning to bundle the tares. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There are groupings and things. Be careful who you sidle up to. Be careful what you buy into with your spiritual paradigm. Be careful if you're the kind of person that I can't, as pastor, come up and say, you know, let's talk about this. Sadly, if you're one of those people, I can't come up and say, let's talk about this. There's, a, there's an end time worldly church that thinks they're all right. They build great big buildings and everybody's saved and it's your best life. And basically it's self-help. But the Bible's not a self-help book. It's not helping you be successful just so you can put a couple of bucks in your pocket. That's, that's not what it's about. Spiritual unity among true Christians is one thing, but religious uniformity among mere professing Christians is another. Yeah, we want unity, but you know what? We need to be unified in truth. Real unity doesn't assemble around the lowest common denominator. Oh, man, anybody with me? Well, I could do that over there. That's not about would you do it over there. So the parable of the mustard seed shows us there's a false growth in the kingdom. The parable of the mustard seed was taught in the rhetorical hyperbole here. Jesus uses a shrub or tree coming from a seed to represent kingdom growth consistent with other trees, kingdom references, Ezekiel 17, 23, Daniel 4, 11 through 21. The seed's growth attracts the presence of evil. Pay attention. Because it depicts birds landing in the branches to dilute the church while taking advantage of its benefits. False teachers. Come on. God likes you just like you are. He wants to bless. It's not that he doesn't, but let's get the whole truth. Listen, if you're 40 years old and, and in diapers, someone didn't love you. Of course, unless you're on the other side. Because <laughs> we all end up going. <laughs> what am I saying? If you're 25 years old and you can't even make mac and cheese to feed yourself, there's some maturation that's missing. Are you hearing me? I, okay. So the picture painted in the parable of the mustard seed by Jesus is of the humble beginnings of the church experiencing an explosive rate of growth. We got some great big giant churches in our country. They're called churches. And so the bush brother Lawrence, grows large, becomes a source of food, rest, shelter for both believers and false professing individuals that seek to consume or take advantage of its benefits while residing or mixing among was produced by the seed. In other words, Jesus predicts that while the church will grow from a small start, it won't remain pure. This is what he's literally saying. While this is not a condemnation of the size of Christianity, it does show us that the greatest burden that comes with it is the things creeping in that are impure. Save yourselves from this. The church can't be like the world. We're not trying to create a culture here that's like the world. We're trying to create a culture here where the Spirit of God would like to dwell. I'm trying to create a culture inside Steve Crow with Bible reading and prayer and submission and adherence to the Word of God to create an environment where Jesus, this is one of mine. 
Now, since Jesus really didn't explain the parable of the mustard seed deeply, we have to use what he did explain in other parables to find its meaning. Matthew 13, 19, the birds represented Satan in the parable of the sower. The tree is symbolic of a world power in Daniel 4, 12 and Ezekiel 17, 23. The parable teaches an abnormal growth that makes it possible for Satan to sit in the branches. We got to be, that's the pastor's job. You want to know what's going on? You come to the pastor, nobody else. That's my job. The birds depicted as evil. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Now, the parable of 11 shows that there is false doctrine in the kingdom. 2 Peter chapter 2, one, verse 1 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who shall, privately, who shall privately shall bring in damnable heresies, false beliefs, things that are not true, even denying the Lord that bought them. And bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall, many, 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 many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom of the truth shall be evil spoken of. I don't like that pastor. I don't like that church. I don't. I'm going to go over here. You're going to go over there. Let's go to a church that makes me feel good. You know what? I hate to break it to you, but sweets make me feel good all the time. Cake and pie and... and Come on, I, I, I never felt bad. But if that's all I ate, I'm doomed to destruction. We need the sincere milk of the word, and then at some point we need to go up and start eating meat. Strong meat. Grow up. Tell your neighbor, grow up. Listen, the mustard seed illustrates false outward development in the kingdom. And the leaven illustrates the false inward development of the kingdom. Throughout the Bible, leaven is a symbol of evil. It is used to picture hypocrisy, carnality, false teaching, and worldly compromise. Sin works invisibly while it grows, corrupts, puffs up. Puff pastry. You know what I'm talking about? Sinning is a process. It's not just an act. It started with a thought. No one could see it. And you entertained it in your mind, and it grew. And then you finally had an opportunity, and believe me, Satan will allow it for you to act upon it. But the thing about sin that's always the same, sin always ends in death. James tells us, and then, and when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Are you hearing me? The real test is not during the age, but at the end of the age. We've heard for many years sermons about Jesus the baptizer. He wants to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. He wants to forgive your sins. He wants to do all that. But very few people talk about the Jesus the thresher. There comes a point when you ever just get to, I just want, to, I just want those that love me. I just want my people. So John introduced Christ's ministry by referring both, to both images, the ancient process of, of, of threshing, which we, 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 we don't do this today, so it's not as pronounced that is, as it once was. And it's a striking scriptural image of the division between the righteous and the unrighteous in God's kingdom. The, the sickle. The dividing, burning this, winnowing this and saving it. In Bible times, grain was laid out on a level ground, hard beaten ground in open air. It was called the threshing floor. The grain was beaten by flails or tread by oxen to separate the grain. And then they would take that product and winnow it and let the wind blow the husks and broken straw to be discarded and burned. To separate this blend of wheat, husks, tossed into the air, the winnowing fan there to blow away what was unwanted. You don't hear that preached in churches. There's, in 
the church sometimes something unworthy. My God. Let it all grow together. Let it all grow. That's beautiful. But there's still a fan in his hand. The grain will be taken to the threshing floor where there will be a beating and a treading of the last days and separating the wheat from the chaff. Listen, today struggles with church faithfulness, holding on to the word of God during political and social unrest, all that's going on, this worldwide pandemic, there's a, a, there's a beating going on and a winnowing going on. and You could say, ah, oh, it's just life. I'm telling you, it's not life. There's a separating going on. There's a finding out going on. People are easily offended and looking for issues and distracted and involved in the things of the world. And in a church, it's just a club or something you do once or twice a week, but it's not your life. People are turning on God. They're turning on their children. They're turning on spouses. They're turning on the church. And they're going to these other churches. They don't require nothing of me. Well, that's not Bible. You've got to produce fruit. If you don't produce fruit, he's going to curse. I never knew you. They're not going to preach this and teach this to you because those people, those men, those women and pastors, I don't care what their names are, don't care whether you make it or not. They want money in the plate. They want another plane, another house, a Bentley. The love of money is still the root of all evil. And the rich have a snare. And I don't want to hurt your feelings, but we live in America. We are the rich. And we have a snare. The fan in God's hand separating the grain from the chaff. God is bringing a revival wind and a shaking to the church. He's winnowing the grain as, as his word has been prophesied. Joel 3.16, the Lord also shall roar out of Zion, utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people. Amen. I want you to stand. I didn't preach this for someone to be depressed. I preached this for someone to become determined. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We're going to cast away the childishness and the immaturity and grow up in the things of God. I must be about my father's business. Haggai goes on in chapter 2, 6, and 7. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. Hebrews declares in chapter 12, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. If you can't handle this kind of preaching, the chaff will blow away. What does a loving parent do when a child is light and not white. You run in there and you shake that child. You gently shake that. Hey, hey, baby, time to get up. And if that child doesn't get up right away, you go in with a little bit more vehemence. Wake up! Yeah. You're going to be late. You're going to miss the bus. I'm just trying to tell everybody it's time to wake up. Yeah. It's time to quit playing at the doorway. It's time to quit fooling around in the house of God. It's time to realize that, you know, this is what God is doing right now. There's going to be a separation. Not all those that cry, Lord, Lord, are going to make it. And sadly, some people have no regard for the gentle hand of God. And they think that gentle hand is just another testimony. Oh, he don't really care. He's not to be listened to or obeyed. God shake us again shake me again God you got enough guts in your Christian hands to shake me God don't let me sleep through this don't let me fall asleep at the spiritual wheel hallelujah time to wake up and redeem the time God is beginning to winnow the grain the chaff will be blown away and he will gather his people I didn't preach this for an emotional reaction tonight. And in fact, the next few weeks I'm going to be teaching. I, I love the emotion as much as you do. 
I love the shouting and altar call and people weeping and crying. There's something amazing about it. But I want to get into your mind and get into your head and get into your heart. You run with your legs, but this race is with your mind. I'll go get my head right. You find yourself being involved in things that are frivolous and foolish. Shake yourself. Wake yourself. Wait a minute. The clock is ticking. Time's running out. What are you going to be known for when it comes? Will you even be known? I don't want to hear, I never knew you. I want to hear those words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But how can I hear those well dones if I'm not doing well? It's time, it's time to honestly to get real. And I'm not just talking about holy standards. I'm talking about holy living. Living unto the Lord. How, you hear what I'm saying? The early Christians were not fed to lions, wild beasts, boiled in oil or set ablaze because they believed that Jesus was just some personal life coach. <laughs> Hello? What are you all about? Heaven or hell? Today they create a picture of a nervous, ingratiating God fawning over man to love him. Oh, I just wish that I wish I could win man's favor. That's the lofty opinion mankind has of themselves. The holy God. His fan is in his hand. He's going to separate minute we think we're something we come walking into the house of God you, oh I'm somebody really the truth is that God is sufficient in and of himself he exists for himself and not for man oh God I'm thankful that even for a worm his eye that he would open a door Give me an opportunity. Oh, Jesus, I just don't want you as Lord and Savior. Be my master. Praise God. I don't want us to live with regret. You're running out of time to tell somebody the truth. You're running out of time to be honest you're running out of time to put Jesus first you're running out of time to make that a very clear declaration to where he'll say well done thou good and faithful servant rather than depart from me I never those are some serious words folks those are some wake up right now words are you hearing me? It's time that we work out our own salvation and let's get back to a little bit of fear and trembling. I'm talking about God here. Hello?